Israel has been in the news lately, as we all know. And uh, yesterday, I had the privilege of speaking at the Daily Bread breakfast once a month. Daily Bread has a breakfast meeting, and uh, so this was their last monthly meeting for the year. They'll do Thanksgiving and help feed those that uh, don't have uh, food to eat during Thanksgiving and then the holidays, and they'll meet back in January. But uh, Larry Shropshire, who is the head of Daily Bread, uh, called me a couple of weeks ago in light of all the news, and he said, Brother Dean, I'd like for you to come, and I'd like for you to speak about Israel. Well, I said, okay, I'll do that. And um, so I uh, shared with those guys a little Bible study entitled, Why Does Israel Matter? And I, I just wanted to mention this. This is not exactly what we're going to talk about, but I think it introduces what we're going to talk about today when we do a little Bible study on Israel and what, what the Bible says about Israel. But I told the men and women that were at the Bible study yesterday morning, I said, remember three words. Why does Israel matter? Remember three words. The word foundations. Secondly, the word footsteps. And thirdly, the word future. The foundations of our faith, men, are Jewish. The Jewish roots of our faith. If your faith only goes back to John Calvin or to Martin Luther, or to John Wesley, or to Charles Spurgeon, it's way too young. Our faith doesn't even go, it goes beyond Augustine and, and the beginnings of the Catholic Church. It goes all the way back to our Jewish roots. The very first church was Jewish. What happened at Pentecost, or in Hebrew, Shavuot, was Jewish. And so... The foundations of our faith as Christians come out of our Jewish roots. So we talked about that yesterday, and I talked to them about some of the very same things that I've talked to you before, about how all the Bible was written by Jewish authors, and all of God's revelation was to the Jewish people, and, um, and that the Jewish roots of our faith is what is the roots of Christianity. So foundations, and then we talked about the importance of footsteps, these are the footsteps of Jesus that march through the Bible. The footsteps of the disciples. The footsteps of the Apostle Paul who wrote 13 of our New Testament letters. And all of them were Jewish. Even Mother Mary was Jewish. She was not Italian praying the rosary. I want you all to know that. She was Jewish. And Jesus was raised in a Jewish home. Why does Israel, why does the Jewish people matter to us? because of foundations, because of footsteps. By the way, the footsteps of Jesus led him to Jerusalem to die on an old rugged cross for us and to be raised from the grave and ascend from Jerusalem and he's returning to Jerusalem. So it is the place where God so loved you and me that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Footsteps. And then I talked thirdly yesterday about Israel matters because of the future. All end time Bible prophecy requires Israel to be back in its land. And an amazing thing took place back in May 14, 1948, when Isaiah prophesied there will come a day where the nation will be born in one day. And Israel was born in a day. It was reborn in a day after almost 2,000 years of dispersion from the land, God has brought the Jewish people back from the four corners of the earth. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today as well. But I want to give you a little Bible study this morning that I pray will be a really, this is really simple, it's foundational, but I, I put it on a half sheet today because I want you to be able to tuck it in your Bible. There are going to be, with all that's going on in Israel and the Middle East right now, there are going to be a lot of people that may come up to you and say, well, I don't understand why Israel matters all that much to us. I don't understand all this stuff about why the Jewish people are involved in a war with a group called Hamas. By the way, does anybody know what Hamas means in Hebrew? Oh, Violence, exactly. It's found in Genesis, it's found several places, over 80 places in the Old Testament. It's found in Genesis 6, 11, where God says, I'm going to destroy the earth. He's speaking to Noah 
I'm going to destroy the earth because the earth is filled with Hamas violence. And so uh, that's where they get their name. Now, we, I'm not going to go into all of that today. That is a whole different situation. But I want you to have a biblical foundation about Israel and what the Bible says about it, about why it's important and why that we know what we know. So are you ready? I made the notes this morning where, again, all you need are some key words to fill in the blanks. And then we're going to touch on as much scripture as we possibly can. I hope that we don't go over today, but if you have to slip out and go, that's fine. But I want to finish this because I want to post this on our website because there are other people that want to hear this message. So let's begin at the beginning. Number one on your outline this morning. The first thing that we need to understand is that Israel was a person. Israel was a person. Who is that person? Anybody know? Jacob, of course. You remember Jacob was one of the three Hebrew fathers? Who are the three Hebrew fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Abraham is the granddaddy, Isaac is the daddy, and Jacob is the son. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob... Uh, after you remember the story, after Jacob had that encounter with the angel, I call it a WWE encounter where he wrestled with the angel uh, all night long. But this is what's really interesting. Jacob didn't believe it was just an angel. Because remember the story? He believed that it was God himself. I believe it was a theophany of Christ. And because Jacob said, I'm going to name this place Peniel. And in Hebrew, panim, face, face to face, panim la panim. I'm going, because I have seen the face of God. I have been in touch with God. And so, what did the angel say to Jacob? Listen to it in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Israel can be interpreted uh, in the Hebrew, prince with God. It can also be interpreted as God contends or one who wrestled with God. In the second temple period during the times of Jesus, it literally meant a man who saw God. Peniel. And that's what Jacob named the place. So the first thing that we need to know about Israel is that Israel first was a person. Here's number two. We're going to build on our outline. The second thing we need to know is that Israel or Jacob received an eternal promise. In Hebrew, it's called a Brit Olam, an everlasting covenant concerning what? The land. The land. Everybody says, well, what's the big deal about the land of Israel? The land over there that's about the size, by the way, Israel occupies uh, about the size of the state of New Jersey. It's very, very small. Those of you guys who've been with me before in Israel, you know we can get around pretty quick to the various sites because they're very close to one another. And so Israel is not a big strip of land. It's highly contended for right now. But it's not a big strip of land. But Jacob received an eternal promise, a berit olam, an everlasting covenant promise about the land. Just like his grandfather had and like his father had. You say, where's that found in the Bible? I'm so glad you asked. First of all, to Abraham, the grandfather. The Lord said these words in Genesis 12, 7. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants... I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. 
Genesis 17, verse 8. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession. There it is in Hebrew. Barit olam, an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Well, God also made the same covenant promise to Isaac. Where's that found? Genesis 26, 3 and 4. Sojourn in the land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give these lands. And I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. By the way, did you see that seed singular? God made the same promise to Abraham that he made to Isaac and then to Jacob. And on. Who comes from that seed lineage, that seed line? Jesus, exactly. How in the world through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would all the world be blessed? Because the Jewish Messiah was going to come through them. And whoever believes on Him all throughout the world shall be saved. So all the nations of the world were going to be blessed because out of their seed was coming the Messiah. But they, God promised Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, the land. The land of Israel. And then Jacob receives the promise in Genesis chapter 28 verse 13. By the way, you can go back and transfer these scriptures. Go back and do your own Bible study. Mark your own Bible and put these in your, in your Bible. Genesis 28, 13. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Folks, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty strong deed right there. Don't you think? A pretty strong property deed. God owned it. And God gave it to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was renamed Israel. Are you still with me? So what do we find first? Israel began as a person, Jacob. Then he, as well as his forefathers, received an eternal promise, a covenant, a berit olam, an everlasting covenant. Here's the third thing. Put this in your notes today. This promise would then be passed on to a people. Who are the people? Jacob had how many sons? Twelve sons. Their offspring, their families would grow and become known as the twelve sons of Israel. Jacob also known as the Israelites. Who are the Israelites? They are the descendants of Israel, of Jacob. Is this making sense? Again, this is very elementary. But if we don't think through this, then we don't have a clear understanding. They would be called the children of Israel, the children of Jacob. Now, you remember the story. Through the story of Joseph... Joseph is down in Egypt. They have no idea that Joseph is now second in command. He's like the prime minister of Egypt. But a famine comes in Israel and Jacob sends the boys down there. And remember through a long line of events, finally the family, the entire family of Jacob and his 12 sons move to Egypt. And how long are Jacob's family and descendants in Egypt? 400 years, exactly. And then through the story of Moses, they come out of the land of Egypt. They disobey, won't go into the land that God had promised them, promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they spend another 40 years in the wilderness. But eventually they come out of that land and they eventually go into their promised covenant land. You'll find this. In Joshua chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, and chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, how Joshua led the children of Israel into the land that God had promised them. By the way, what's the big deal about the land? 
the land is God's stage. It is where he decided to enact his divine drama of all generations. It is where he decided that he would send his son who would die on the cross, be raised from the grave, ascended, and is returning to. God decided that. I'm going to send you into the land and you're going to prepare the land for the coming of the Savior where all the world will be blessed. Now I believe that God has brought them back into the land a second time to prepare for His second coming, His second return. Here's the fourth thing that I want you to get. Through Jacob or Israel's fourth son, whose name was Judah, the prophesied Messiah would come. Remember at the end of Jacob's life, he's blessing all of his sons. And some of them were not really blessings. Some of them kind of got a curse put on them. But he's ble- when he comes to Judah, he says these words. Now listen to this. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children will bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. Where do we get the idea of the lion of the tribe of Judah? Right there. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down as a lion, and as a lion who shall rouse him. The scepter, now listen to this, the scepter, the ruling scepter, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until, we say Shiloh, but in Hebrew it's Shiloh, until Shiloh comes. What is Shiloh? It is Shiloh is not only a place where the tabernacle stood for 369 years, just above Jerusalem. It is also a person. It is the Messiah. And so through Judah, the Messiah would come. And, uh, he, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, follow with me. Jacob has 12 sons. But only through one of those sons would the Messiah, the promised Messiah come. That's the fourth son, Judah. Follow his lineage. Who would come from the line of Judah? Someday, we're going to have to fast forward a little here. Someday, a guy by the name of David would come out of that lineage. And then fast forward, who would come out of David's lineage? Jesus. Do you see this? Out of the descendant of Jacob's fourth son, Judah, the Messiah, Shiloh, will come. And he came. Born in Bethlehem and raised up in Nazareth, just like the Bible says. Um, Headquartered in Capernaum. By the way, where are all those places? I, I asked this question yesterday and... And, you know, there were people that had kind of a puzzled look on their... What nation is Bethlehem in? Israel. What nation is Nazareth in? Israel. What nation is Capernaum in? Jesus' headquarters for His ministry on the Sea of Galilee. It's in Israel. What nation is Jerusalem in? Where He died and rose again and ascended and is coming back to? Israel. Israel is the stage. The land is the stage. And Jesus walked that land. Matthew begins his gospel with some profound words. We kind of gloss over this, but boy, I'm telling you, once you see this, this will make a Presbyterian shout right here. Listen to this. Matthew 1.1. Listen to how he starts. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Jewish Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Wow. Through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, Jesus. It's profound. And so we need to understand that. That we need to understand that whole progress, pro- progression, that whole, and all of that comes out of Israel. All of that comes out of the Jewish people. Now, here's the fifth thing on our Bible study notes today. We also know that the Bible says 
God said to the Jewish people, I'm going to give you this promised land, but if you mess up, if you disobey me, I will punish you by expelling you from the land. Now, we saw that happen. Let me give you the, the point here so you can write it in your notes. The descendants of Jacob would be punished. Punished is the key word there. For their rebellion against God and removed from their land. We see that the first time. What happened with the Babylonian captivity? How many years was Judah dispelled from their land? Seventy years. And God kept His word. Just like He said, I'm going to take you out of the land. But then He brought them back to the land. And then after the rejection of Jesus Christ as their own Messiah and through the destruction of the temple in uh, 70 A.D. at the hand of the Romans, and then one more rebellion uh, under Simon bar Kokhba in 135, 500,000 Jewish people were killed. And literally the Jewish people were forbidden. There were still a few that remained, but they were forbidden to come back inside Jerusalem for a period of years by Titus. And they were dispersed all over the world to the slave markets all over the world. Just like God said would happen. If you rebel against me, just like a father disciplines his children. If you rebel against me, there are going to be significant consequences. You will be disciplined. You will be punished. Just listen to a couple of these verses. Now, there are many of them in Scripture, but I pulled a few out for you to be able to mark your Bible. Leviticus 26, 33. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. This is God's promise to Israel if they disobeyed Him when they came into the land. He reminded them in Deuteronomy 4. Take heed to yourselves lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which He made with you and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and make a carved image in the form of anything, that's idolatry, and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke Him to anger, I call heaven and and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but be utterly destroyed, and the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. Did that happen? Yes, it happened twice. It happened during Babylonian captivity, but Babylonian captivity was very limited. The people were dispersed to Babylon and a few to Egypt. God promised here, it will also happen across the world. You will be dispersed to the four corners of the earth. Deuteronomy 28, 37. You shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. Deuteronomy 28, 64. Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known wood and stone. And among those nations you will find no rest. Man, for the last 2,000 years the Jewish people have been under nothing but persecution and pogroms. And of course, Hitler was the the ultimate, and the Holocaust was the ultimate persecution of the Jewish people. In those nations you will find no rest, nor the sole of your foot have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. Man, that is a tough, tough disciplinary action by the Lord. But let me ask you guys something. Would their expulsion from the land be permanent? Would God divorce Himself from His chosen people and say, no, that's it. I'm finished with you. The answer is no, no, no. Here's number six on your outline. In the last days... God promised that He would regather His dispersed chosen people from the four corners of the earth. 
It's, it's amazing. I've shared this with you before. There are 14 prophecies and 67 scriptures in the Bible that say in the end of times, the last days, Israel will be brought back to its land. I, I don't understand people that can stand up and say God is through with the Jewish people. Now listen, they have to be saved. Every, there's no way to heaven except through the Jewish Messiah who shed His rich, royal, regal blood on the cross of Calvary. They must be born again. But for the purposes of God, He has brought them back to their land because He's a covenant-keeping God. By the way, if He didn't keep His covenant with them, why would we think He would necessarily be obligated to keep His covenant with us? No, the gifts, Paul said in Romans 11, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Man, we need to understand that. The Lord told the prophet Ezekiel to prophesy to a barren and desolate land. Listen to some of these verses, guys. Ezekiel 36, 6 through 12. Listen what God said through Ezekiel. And this can't be Babylonian captivity because he's talking about the whole world. He's talking about the Jewish people coming back from the world, not just Babylon, not just Egypt. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, and the valleys, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and my fury, because you have borne the shame of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have raised my hand in an oath that surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. How many of you have been with me and we've eaten the fruit at breakfast? I, prophecy tastes pretty good, doesn't it? And they don't use all the chemicals on their fruit and their vegetables, and that's why they're so much sweeter. Uh, they're just fantastic. For indeed, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and shall be, you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it. Not just Judah to the south, all of it. The whole land of Israel. The cities shall be inhabited the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you man and beast and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited. Now listen to this. I will make you inhabited as in former times, but I will do better for you than at your beginnings. Is the modern nation of Israel more sophisticated and better than the former land of Israel? Man, just travel with me sometime. Interstate highways, skyscrapers, one of the top five nations in technology across the entire world. Has a, uh, a, G, a gross domestic product, uh, G, what is that, GDP, that's greater than most nations that are 50 times bigger than it is. It's just amazing what's happened there in 75 years. It's just the prophecy of Scripture being fulfilled. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Yes, I will cause men to walk on you, my people Israel. They shall take possession of you and you shall be their inheritance. No more shall you bereave them of children. Here's God's promise. Verse 24 of Ezekiel 36. For I will take you from among the nations... Let me read that again. I will take you from among the nations. Plural. Not Babylon. Not just Egypt. From the nations. I will gather you from out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. Wow. In Ezekiel 37... By the way, let me just say this. Why would God do this? Is it because they were repentant? Is, is it because, you know, He did it because of His own name. He did it because He is a covenant-keeping God. And He promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the discipline now is over and He's brought them back to their own land. The very next chapter, what happens? Ezekiel 37 is the vision of the valley of dry bones. I believe, I've said this before, that when Ezekiel, when God allowed Ezekiel to see that valley full of dry bones, it could have been some of the pictures that we've often seen of the Holocaust, of mass graves. 
no hope. Our hope is gone. We are utterly destroyed and destitute. Six million Jews, a third of the Jewish population killed during the Holocaust. Our hope is gone. Listen to Ezekiel 37. Just listen to this. They, Ezekiel is told to prophesy. Let me shorten this. Ezekiel is told to prophesy to this valley full of dry, dead bones. He, God asked him, can these bones live, son of man? And Ezekiel, I love Ezekiel's answer. He said, Lord, you know that. <laughs> Have you ever said that? Lord, I have no idea. <laughs> Only you know that. Preach to them, Ezekiel. Preach to them. And what happened? The rattling. And those dry, dead bones came back together. And sinews came upon them. And tendons. And listen to what Ezekiel 37.10 says. They lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones... Listen, these bones are the whole house of Israel. I've heard preachers preach on Ezekiel 37 and say, well, this is a picture of the dry dead church. It needs to come back together and get revived. That might be a good illustration, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that these, these bones are the whole house of Israel who had no hope, who were dead, dry, and gone, now standing back up on their feet in the last days. Our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We ourselves are cut off. What was God going to do? Thus says the Lord God, verse 12, Behold, O my people, I will listen to this. We've seen this in our lifetime. I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves, your mass graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Jeremiah adds these words. Jeremiah 31.10 Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. These are powerful verses. You say, but, but pastor, all of that had to do with the Babylonian captivity. There's nowhere in the Bible that talks about any other dispersion or them coming back a second time. Oh, really? I want you to mark in your Bibles, in your notes, Isaiah 11, 11 and 12. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah says. It shall come to pass in that day. In that day is talking about the last of the days. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set His hand Again, the second time. Did you hear that? The what time? The second time. To recover the remnant of His people who are left. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Isaiah said it's going to happen a second time. First time was Babylonian captivity, yes. But Isaiah says it's going to happen the second time. God is going to, and this time when it happens, they're going to be brought back from the four corners of the earth. Here's number seven on your outline. He would bring them back to their promised land to prepare for the coming again of the Prince of Peace. They're the preparers. The preparers. Of, listen, Israel's role is preparation. The church's role is salvation. Keep Israel and the church separate. Do not blend them together. Do not, as replacement theology preachers say, well, the church is now taken over and God is finished with Israel. He has no plans, no purposes for Israel. Tell God that. How, how ridiculous is that? It's our job to preach salvation to the world. 
But God has brought them back into the land to prepare the place and the platform for the second coming of Jesus, for the Messiah to return. Israel's role is preparation. Our role as the church is salvation. Keep them separate. When you start fusing them together, that's where the Bible, well, it doesn't really mean that. It doesn't really mean that they're going to come back a second time. It really doesn't mean. All of those promises that God made to Israel, no, those all belong to the church now. Mm. Don't do that or you will not understand the Word of God. God has not replaced Israel with the church. He has just birthed the church for a special purpose. He still has a purpose and plan for Israel and the Jewish people. Now listen, I want this to be clear. I said it a while ago. I want to say it one more time. Everybody has to be saved in order to come into the presence of God. But that does not mean that God can't use people for His plans and purposes. There's only one way to be saved. And that's through Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. So get that in your mind, your heart. But God has not finished with the Jewish people. I want you to really understand that. Now, there's a lot of verses in Zechariah. You find them there. We're running out of time this morning. I want to make sure that we have time the prophet Zechariah speaks of a time when Israel will be back in its land. Read those verses. Look them up and mark them in your Bible. Um, but I want to I end, we've got one more point, but I want to end with talking about some verses out of the New Testament. You say, well, Pastor, everything you read today is out of the Old Testament. Is there anything in the New Testament that would lead us or lend us to know that God still has a plan and purpose for Israel? Romans chapter 11. By the way, Romans 9, 10, and 11 is all about the Jewish question. Romans 9, their past. Romans 10, their present. Romans 11, their future. Read Romans 9, 10, and 11. Most people, by the way, they do a study in Romans, they'll skip chapter 9, 10, and 11, or just take key verses out of it because they don't understand it. It's all about Israel. It's all about the Jewish question. It's all about the fact that Israel is coming back to their land. Now, now listen to what Paul says. The, how many of you believe the Apostle Paul? You believe what he said? Romans chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Listen to this. I say then, has God cast away His people? Uh-oh. Who are His people there? The Jewish people. The chosen people that God chose for His plans and purposes. Has God cast them away? Certainly not. Listen what He says. For I also am an Israelite. What is an Israelite? I'm out of the twelve tribes of Jacob. By the way, what tribe was Paul from? Anybody know? Benjamin, tribe of Benjamin, exactly. I also am an Israelite. Jacob was my great, 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 times seven granddaddy. <laughs> he was my, I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away His people whom He foreknew. If you ever hear a preacher say, get up and say, God's finished with the Jewish people. We're not talking about any of that stuff because it doesn't matter. Well, what about Paul? What about what Paul said in Romans 11? Listen to what he says, verses 11 and 12. I say then, have they stumbled that they should utterly fall? Have they completely been thrown away by God? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy... Salvation has come to us. Salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? How much more when the day when their eyes will be opened and they will come to Jesus? Well, that's powerful. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. 
For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it's written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is My covenant with them, when I take away their sins. Concerning the Gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, the fact that I chose them, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of the tribes, because of the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Praise God, we don't have to worry about losing our salvation. Because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. By the way, there will be no lasting peace until the Prince of Peace comes Amen. in the Middle East. Just and, and guys, I want to say one more word. I said this yesterday, and I want you guys to hear this. What's going on in Israel right now may appear to be missiles and bombs and tanks and all of that. It may appear to be a very ferocious physical battle. There's a spiritual battle being fought behind the scenes that we've got to understand with our spirit man. We've got to understand that the forces of hell itself are coming against the plans and purposes of God and have been since the day that Israel came back into the land. What are they trying to stop? What is the devil trying to stop? He knows that when Jesus returns to this earth, it is curtains for him. He's fighting against it with all of his proxies. We hear about Iran's proxies. The devil has proxies too that fight in his behalf. Listen to me. I don't, I don't know about you guys. I don't want to be on the wrong side of this thing. I, 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 I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. And in Matthew 25, all the nations of the world are gathered in the Kidron Valley, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and the nations are judged on their basis of how they treated Israel. Read it. We, we, we use those verses a lot to talk about helping the poor. I was hungry and you fed me, and I was thirsty, you gave me drink. All of those verses. Well, when did we see you this way? Lord, when you did it to the least of one of these, my Adelphos, my brethren, and that word can be translated, of course, spiritual brother or sister, but it is most translated as ethnic brother or sister. How you treat or treated the Jewish people. I don't want to be on the wrong side of that. In fact, that's why we started Harvest of Israel and all of that. Think about all the attempts of Satan. Think about Egypt when Pharaoh ordered that all the little babies be drowned and, and be taken out. It was Satan's attempt. He was behind the whole thing to destroy the seed, to destroy the Messiah. What about Herod? When Jesus was born, what did he proclaim in Bethlehem? Slaughter all the little boys. What about, what was the spirit behind Hitler? Kill all the Jews. Maybe we'll prevent the Messiah from coming. And now this conflict. Guys, I don't want to be on the wrong side. Jesus is coming again. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, in Israel. Here's the eighth thing that I want to leave you with today, and this is so important. Are you prepared? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? I'm telling you, I believe that we are living in the last of the last days. I'm not a date setter. But when you see all these confluent streams of prophecy coming together at one time toward the same, same thing at the same time, you know, guys, we've got to be getting close. So are you ready? You know Christ is your Savior. You say, Pastor, how can I do that? Humble your heart. Be willing to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I turn from my sin and self. I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross to pay for all my sin. I believe He rose up from the grave and defeated sin, death, hell, and the grave. And I believe in Him as my only hope of eternal life, my only hope of salvation. 
Jesus said in John 3 to a religious man, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And unless you're born again, you will not see or enter the kingdom of God. To a Jewish religious man, Jesus said those words. And he says those words to us. So, come to Jesus today. Give him your heart and your life. Father, how I pray that you've taken our Bible study this morning and helped us to understand Israel, beginning as a person all the way through as a nation and now to accomplish your purposes in the end time. Father, help us to, to, to not be asleep, as you said in 1 Thessalonians 5, but help us to be wide awake, sober to the day in which we are living. And may we do everything we can to reach our friends with the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we know that the, the, the day is going to come to an end and the night will be far spent and there will be no time to work. So help us work while it is still day. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, men. God bless you.